Starting the computer, I, I when it came back up, I had the settings thing from Zoom that uh, had a little thing on there about video. I clicked it on. That may have been it. I don't know, but here I am. Woo! All right. <laughs> Well, thanks, Monty, for giving me some of your time so I can interview you for my little, my little uh, YouTube page designed to draw attention to not just myself and that book that you got, but uh, the people yeah. in it, hopefully. So, but um, my privilege. I was gonna, what was that? My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so for having gonna, me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to go deep on this one. I'm going to ask you about music and art. And All that's right. it. All and right. The and the juggling of the juggling Not, of both. Nothing too personal, huh? Uh, if you <laughs> want to go there, I'll leave that up to you. But uh, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to go there. I'll well, tell you that. <laughs> well, I, I think I heard of you guys because of the video for "If I Were a Killer" that was on Headbangers Ball. Yeah. And I think I heard of the band before that. And um, I knew that you were had some friendship with King's X, who I know you toured with a few times, at least. Right. And then I saw that video and I was like, oh, I really like this. This is, it was really super heavy metal, really good riffs. But then the singing was really melodic and multi-layered. And I know that lazy comparison is always the Beatles, but um, you know, so when I saw the video, I bought the record and I was like, well, this is like all that stuff, but it's also, you know, this is like Holly's singing. It, you know, there's there's a lot of really nice singing that um really juxtaposed the music quite quite nicely. And it, it really stood out to me. And I would play it for people and they a lot of people I played it for you know, some of them couldn't make heads or tails of it, and some of them really liked it right away, you know, <laughs> and I imagine that's probably the reaction you guys got. So I yeah. want to start this off by asking about um, your background in music and how you ended up um, forming the Galactic Cowboys. I know there was a band that you were in with your drummer, Alan, called The Awful Truth, I guess. Mm -hmm. That was right before that, and you guys were based out of Houston? Right. Okay. So um, how did it turn out that you decided you wanted to uh, be a musician, play music, and how, how did it get to the point where you were um, in the awful truth and what was going on musically that helped uh, paved the way to get to that point where you were in this band, the awful truth? Okay, well, it was a long journey. Uh, uh -huh. I, I didn't get started uh, actually playing anything until I was like a senior in high school. And what? Some friends of mine were uh, in a band uh, that, you know, I went to school with in high school and I saw them playing and I was just like, oh my God, I've got to do that. So I bought a guitar and started kind of late. I was like 18 when I started playing. And so uh, I went to college and basically just practiced while I was getting a, a degree in art uh, in Missouri. And so all through college, I just basically wrote songs and practiced and tried to, you know, get good enough to play in a band. And right. after that, I, uh, after college, I got into a cover band and did that for about a year. And then I got a, a job offer to be in a, uh, a guy's band in Houston that uh, toured around. It was a Christian band okay. and uh, he needed a bass player. And at the time I didn't even own a bass, but I was like, yeah, I can do it. So I went and bought a bass and flew down to Houston, auditioned and got the job. And, right. and uh, the guys that were in this guy's uh, backup band were me, uh, Alan Doss, the drummer and a guitar player named David Von Oler King. And after we left uh, that project, uh, we started The Awful Truth as a three-piece. And we did uh, some demos uh, and then broke up after about a year. Right. Uh, but uh, Metal Blade actually took the demos and pressed it into a CD and released it. So uh, After you guys broke up? Yeah. We were actually, 
we actually broke up and they came to us uh, wanting to sign us and see if we get back together. And we we're like, no, that's not going to happen. But uh, they, they still put out the, the CD and uh, it's out there if you can find it. And, uh, but uh, six months after uh, we had broken up in The Awful Truth, uh, Alan and I formed a new band and actually got signed uh, to Geffen Records as Galactic yeah. Cowboys. Right. Right. Now that, now that part's really interesting because that's a whole other fucking universe back then as far as that kind of stuff goes. Um, yeah. Did, uh, did you and Alan have this envision of like, well, we got, we're going to start this band um, and we're going to try to combine sort of uh, heavy metal, thrash metal kind of stuff with like uh, layered melodic vocals. Did you like, did you guys know Ben before you were like, hey, you should be the singer? And um, did you know Dane? How, how, did, how did you guys get the other two members to join up with yeah. your vision? Well, uh, Ben and Dane were both fans of, of uh, The Awful Truth, and they would come to our shows and hang out, and we, you know, we became friends, and uh, once we split from The Awful Truth, Alan and I were like, let's start a band, and and uh, those were a couple of guys I thought of, and so uh, I went to them, and uh, Alan and I were doing demos uh, for some of that stuff, and um, so, you know, we already had some songs written and kind of demoed. Right. And so that, that's kind of how we tried out Ben and Dane. But uh, the whole vision of it uh, actually started, um, I guess, in the, the awful truth. We were kind of heading in that direction. But uh, I wanted to, like, push it heavier. And uh, so when I left, it was just, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to you know, take that thrash stuff that I love. I was listening to a lot of Anthrax, Metallica, Megadeth, you know, bands like yeah. that. And um, so I wanted to take that and make it even more melodic, you know, and uh, I, I'd grown up listening to gospel music, you know, like quartet kind of things. And uh, I love the Beatles and, you know, all that stuff. So, uh, we were, we were like, hey, let's do vocal harmonies. And uh, we got together our first practice and we were like, let's all take a part, you know, and do this four part harmony thing. And it was just instant. We were just like, wow. Right. We really, we really harmonize well together. Let's let's do this. So, Was anybody in the band into stuff like uh, other vocal type things like the Beach Boys at all? Was that was there? Because I noticed that the Beach Boys, it's either people either really like the Beach Boys if they go through that portal. Because, you know, it's it's kind of a hard portal to go through when you're a teenager because you think the Beach Boys are kind of lame unless you grew up with Endless Summer. And I never really liked them. And then I kind of went through the portal and I was like, ah, I get it. Um, yeah. Was there any, uh, any, any of that kind of stuff or any other vocal things besides the... Uh, easy to make the comparison Beatles reference that I'm sure you've heard a lot. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't know that. I mean, I wasn't a huge beach boys fan. I like pet sounds and uh, you know, I, I think we all had, uh, you know, listened to that kind of stuff, but you know, Alan, Alan's the biggest Beatles freak of, of all of us. And, you know, but, I think we all kind of grew up uh, liking that kind of stuff, you know, the Hollies, uh, all that kind of stuff that, I mean, they, people used to just do harmonies a lot more than, you know, they do now. But sure. A, sure. There's a lot of, there's a lot of great, you know, like the early birds, all the, the association, yeah. there's all kinds of, I think that we probably are rough to the same, close to the same age. So I, I think, probably might have some of the same reference points outside of rock music and uh you know like cheap trick um oh yeah that's uh that's love, love cheap trick uh i think we all love that um yeah they were a big influence and... right so so how do you go from like starting a band after you would just go well i'm gonna start this this other band how do you go from starting the Galactic Cowboys and making demos to finding somebody that's going to get you signed to David Geffen, Geffen's record label 
in 1990, 91? Yeah. So, how, yeah I mean, that's like a different universe, obviously, but like. Right. Well, we had some breaks. Uh, we, our management um, was the same management as King's X. And, you know, naturally that's why we get compared to them constantly. Uh, but uh, it, we were managed by Sam Taylor and uh, we, we got an opportunity to go out and open for King's X on a tour before we were even signed. And so we got a lot of, a lot of exposure on that and kind of got a buzz going that way. And uh, we actually had an offer uh, before we ever left that tour. And so uh, there was a label interested in signing us and actually a couple. But uh, when we got back to uh, Houston off that tour, we did a showcase where uh, like 11 labels or something showed up. And one of them was Geffen. And at first, the guy didn't really get it. Uh, his name was Gary Gersh, who later signed Nirvana. And <laughs> but uh, he ended up really liking us after he heard the demo and said, yeah, I want to sign these guys. And so uh, we signed with Geffen and then uh, he signed Nirvana after that. <laughs> and that kind of blew everything up. But, well, uh, well, I mean, like there, I'm sure there were some steps after you got signed, you had to record this record. And then I'm mm -hmm. sure there's all these, you know, I've never really been a part of that. I've known people that were a part of that machine or, or um, had experience going through that machine or whatever, but I got to say, you're the only person in the book who, who, who I've talked to that actually was um, signed to a major label and had their record come out at the same time that Nirvana's Nevermind uh, record came out and, and blew up. So you were, you were in a very small category, category yeah. of one. But like, <laughs> and also there's like, like when you played with King's X, what period of King's X was it? What, what, what record, were they still dressing the way they dressed in the Sgt. Pepper vests and all that kind of stuff yeah uh it was oh i'm trying to think which album i think they were on gretchen okay about right. the time uh right. so uh i don't i don't remember <laughs> but, right, uh, right. My, but, my, my point my point being is that that period of time there, there was no real comparison with what you guys were doing based on just the first album alone except for really maybe some of the vocal stuff in King's X. But even then, I don't really think that, I don't think you guys really sound like King's X musically or even vocally, except for the fact that there's an association and you sang on one King's X song on the Faith, Hope, Love album, I think. Mr. Wilson. Yeah, Sometimes. yeah. Right. Well, there's no, there really no comparison musically with you guys from what was going on back then at all really no. so just how people how people look instead of uh you know whatever um but then the record comes out and i think you said in the book that the guy that signed you played you the record and then you guys are like uh that's kind of cool and then it just blew up and then i guess your record kind of got shelved or just yeah well what happened is we uh first we waited like almost a year they 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 held us back because they wanted to wait until the new guns and roses album came out and so we waited about a year to put the album out and they they were finally like all right we're gonna go ahead and put it out and so uh they put it out in 91 and uh we we toured the first album and uh i believe it was then that they told us, all right, we'll go make the second album. Well, in that period, Nirvana had come along. Right. And uh, so, uh, no, I'm going to go back. He actually played us, He, I'm sorry, he actually played us Nirvana's uh, pre-release at, yeah. at our first uh, release party for the first album. So that's when it was. Uh, this was this was back around ninety one, so my memory is fading a little bit. It's a long time. It's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> so so anyway, 
they put their album out and we thought, hey, this is cool stuff, you know, but he didn't even think it was going to be huge. He thought we were going to be huge. And he was telling yeah. us, yeah, you guys, you're the thing. <laughs> and uh, he's like, Nirvana is just, you know, I, I think they'll sell some records, but you, you know, but he was probably just saying that. <laughs> But anyway, when uh, when, you know, the video came out for Nirvana and everything, it would it's just exploded. And then at that point, then is when they told us, all right, we'll go make another album. We'll see how it does. You know, by the time we put it out, I, I really think they were done with us, uh, which is sad because Space in Your Face, our second album, was actually probably our best album we've ever done. But um, I love that. But no I think one. The first and, one's, you know, I think the first one's great, too. Uh, but it's like the song I always thought that they should have pushed was that song Kill Floor. Because that has everything uh, you guys do in that. that yeah. Way. Yeah, that was like, a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I don't it's, think I don't think Geffen really knew what to do with this because even picking a single for him was like, uh, I don't know, you know, will it be, you know, my school or you know, this one or that one or you know, and so I don't know. I don't know that they ever really understood totally what we were about but by the time nirvana had taken off they were just like they, you know they just weren't gonna push us like they were you know and so right which is crazy because like space in your face is like a great such a nice spread of just all kinds of really cool musical yeah. ideas like and like uh the singing is really great the songwriting is really great there's some really moody long like yeah long we we did it's a great. we did a tour with uh, Dream Theater on on that album, and you know it, it just looked like, hey, this is going to be great. You know, their fans are liking us, and and even though we weren't really like them, you know, um, but it just uh, we were we finished the Dream Theater tour, and we did a tour with Sabotage for a couple of weeks. The band from Florida. Yeah, and then just got a call that, uh, yeah, you've been dropped, you know? And so we just jumped on the bus and went back to Houston, and that was it. We Well, what did, what did the four of you guys think about all this stuff as it was unfolding? Did you guys were like, man, we, we you know, we made this really quirky, unique record. Um, were, you, were you guys just, like, bemused by the whole thing, or were you just taking it as, as, as it came? Because... No, that's a long time ago. But. Yeah, we were we were really discouraged, actually. Sure. Because, uh, we had high hopes of you know it really being something big, and then you know, and then to ultimately get dropped, you know, it was it was pretty it was pretty is rough. That, uh, is that like a two year period or a three year period? It was it was a couple years, uh, I guess. Uh, I think we broke up and probably 92, 93. And then uh, I was just like, all right, let's start doing demos and get re-signed, you know? And, but, uh, you know, Dane at that point was like, I, I think I'm done. And he wanted to do something different. So he quit. Alan actually quit for a, a week or two. <laughs> and, uh, and then we got, uh, we got an offer from Metal Blade to, you know, sign and do some more albums so brian we up, yeah we ended up signing with metal blade and ended up putting out you know several more <laughs> albums so were you guys into like sketch comedy and stuff because like on on uh, those first couple records i hear uh i hear some um the influence of maybe a couple people that like watching uh late night uh television or watch their fair share of uh sketch comedy oh like, yeah i'm or Saturday Night Live or SCTV or that kind oh, yeah. of stuff. Yeah, we we loved all that stuff. Uh, and in fact, we our goal was to play Saturday Night Live, but also host it. Right. We wanted to be the first band to host and play as the musical guest. And of course, that did not happen. But yeah, we we were just kind of goofy guys back then. Uh, you know, we. We were serious about the music, you know, the music, but uh, we just, we had a lot of fun just goofing around and we did things on albums that I, you know, now I look back at and go, 
what were we thinking? <laughs> you know, it's you, were just, good, you were having a good time. Yeah, we just, you know, we weren't afraid to try or do anything, you know, on as far as the albums go or or whatever. And so yeah. we just had well, fun. Yeah. I mean, the first two records specifically are pretty, pretty fearless records, you know. They're just like, this is it, you know, check it yeah. out. Yeah. And so um after you guys got re-signed to Metal Blade and Machine Fish came out, you did some more touring and stuff. And was it a case of just kind of uh uh, it's it's not sticking. We're just gonna we're just gonna bow out after a certain amount of time. Was it that kind of situation? I would say for me, uh, I gave it ten years. Uh, around two thousand, I finally said, you know, we we've, we've tried and tried, and <laughs> you know, I think uh, we've done like six albums at that point, and you know, and we just weren't really breaking out. We were still struggling. And so I just, uh, I, I said, I think it's time to end it. But, uh, you know, I made, I went and made three solo albums and, um, yeah, you know, did, did that. And then, uh, we did some reunion tours, um, back around, I think 15, or something like that or maybe it was no it was way earlier than that maybe it's 2010 or something uh we did a reunion tour and then uh a few years ago we actually got an offer to do another album from a label and so we ended up getting back together and doing another album so uh we're we're back together and uh you know we don't we don't play a lot because you know of covid and whatever but you know, we're actually still a functioning band, as far as I know. <laughs> cool. Um, we, at, aside from the first two records, or "Space in Your Face," of the other ones on Metal Blade, which record do you like uh, the most? Because I told you when I talked to you that I thought the um, "House That Bud Bought" was my favorite one. I didn't think it was weird sounding. I didn't think the songs were bad. I thought it was actually like probably my favorite record after the first two yeah. and i think you said really like yeah <laughs> I, guess, I guess i guess that record has sort of a, a weird reputation to the fans of the band but it's like i thought it was a great record you know and, um, cool i was kind of yeah. surprised to hear that yeah i think there's stuff on all of our albums that you know is great and then you know there's other stuff you look back on and go well maybe it wasn't as good or whatever but I like all the albums. Um, there's some that are stronger than others, but uh, I think they all had something a little different, you know. And uh, yeah. So how does your how does your art? Um, I mean, we, we talked a lot about the Galactic Cowboys, but uh, you've also you're a painter and an artist, and you've always have been. How did that stuff sort of intertwine with your musical uh, endeavors over the years, like? Um, did you um you said you went to college to get an art degree and stuff were you always like kind of kid that was uh, were you doing art before you even thought about playing a, a guitar and stuff like oh that? yeah yeah um yeah i started like just as a kid drawing and you know creating i mean i grew up in an era where there weren't video games or anything like that you know no computers or whatever so you know, you, you drew and painted and created and made stuff and, you know, entertained yourself. So that's the way I grew up. And then when I was in high school, I took art every year that I was in high school. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, I decided to go to college and just major in art and, you know. How was that? What is the art degree? What is the art degree give? Um, I've never been to college and I've never had that experience. What what does an art degree mean? I don't even know. Uh, absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, uh, it, it, I don't know. I mean, I, I learned a lot, but would I do it over again like today in this day and age? I probably wouldn't have to go to college. I could just go on YouTube and watch you know, instructional videos on how to paint. And, but I don't know, uh, 
you know, I, I just learned a lot of stuff in college and, but really it's up to you after you leave to develop it, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, my part, my partner says, uh, and she went to school too with the bills to prove it. She says they do all the stuff about like teaching you these skills, but they don't, they don't ever really mention the skills of how to apply that to something that's constructive. That could be a, a career or just how to market yourself or that kind of thing. Which, yeah, you know, I, that, that's, that's a very valid point. You know, I went, I went to college and my senior year, I, I will never forget. I'm standing there and I'm thinking, so what am I going to do now? Like you, you can't, you can't go into a company and just go, Hey, I draw really good. You know, right. it's like, they don't care, you know? <laughs> and so you have to figure out like what you're going to do with it. And fortunately for me, I got to like do album covers, you know, for my band and uh, yeah. a lot of stuff like that, t-shirts and gradually people, you know, saw my stuff and started going, Hey, would you, you know, do something for me? Would you do a painting and how much would you charge to, you know, do this? And, yeah. you know, over the years I I've done, you know, quite a few, uh, you know, quite a few commissions and, uh, but I just kept working at it, kept trying to improve. And then um, I finally got a break a few years ago uh, doing murals for the School of Rock here in Kansas City that they, they had this whole building that they just wanted murals all over it of rock stars and yeah. I was I was just like this is the best job I've ever had you know and it was just so much fun and so you know that was great but then that ended and so I was like okay uh, man I wish I could find another way of just doing my art and you know and one day I woke up and thought why don't I do paintings of rock stars like I did for school of rock except I'll do them on smaller canvases right you know? and so that's what I started doing and I made my own website and from there I started posting on uh, Facebook all the stuff that I would do and pointing people to the website and then from that, people more and more started wanting me to, you know, to commission me. And right. uh, so it, this last year has just been great for the art. It's just, I've, I've been constantly busy with commissions. And uh, so that's, that's where I'm at now. I, I, that's about all I have time to do now is just paint and do my paintings. And so... Yeah, the older I get, the more I appreciate this skill set of being able to do this stuff, even though I don't think about it at all. I don't think, I don't sit there and do this and think, boy, I'm really good, or this is really going to be great. I just do it because I have to do it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it turned out to be this, you know, kind of this half assed freelance kind of living. Yeah, so many. Somebody asked me uh, not too long ago, what is it that motivates you, you know, to do your art? And, you know, what, do you, what are you thinking about <laughs> as you paint? And I'm thinking of bills, uh, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the rent. Uh, Survival. <laughs> yeah, starvation, you know. So it's yeah. like, that'll motivate you, you know, so. Oh yeah, totally, totally. You know, but I'm 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 really grateful, you know, that I, because I think about as rough as it is to be driven like that, it would be way worse to not have anything that you'd like to do. You know, uh, yeah. and after all this time to actually still have that, you know, it's like, you know, it's kind of a cool thing. It's actually a very cool thing. But I, you know, yeah. I would I would just have to sit here and just think about it that way because yeah. I don't. Because I'm, I'm not thinking about it when I'm doing whatever. I'm just right. like, you know, and, and it's, as I'm sure you know, it's also compulsive. And if you're going to get paid for it too, then it's like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Are you, do you have like a, a, a regular job? Um, I do some stuff part time, but uh, really the last, last year, the, the paintings have been the major source of my income. And, 
um, you know, it with technology and everything with social media and, you know, it, it's opened up a whole new way to advertise your stuff and let people know you do it, which yeah. you know, 10 years ago, you know, I didn't really have that, but, you know, it's been like, uh, I, I've got a podcast that I, you know, I can talk about it. I can advertise, you know, I can let people know I'm doing that. Uh, you got, Facebook, you know, you got Instagram. For you better got, or for worse. For better yeah, or you, you got all these ways of, you know, throwing your stuff out there and saying, hey, you know. I'm go, alive. Yeah, go check out my stuff. Here's what I did, you know, yesterday and and uh, showing your paintings. And so it's it's a great way to, to advertise, get your name out there. And it's yeah. it changed things for me. I. I've never had this much work before. Yeah, I thought for sure with the COVID and all that, all the wonderful stuff that we've all been dealing with in this crazy year, that I would be a goner for sure, but actually it was yep. the opposite. You know, I it know. Was the, it, I, was the, it was the total opposite. It was like, yeah. you're also the only other person I've talked to in my book whose cousin was Dee Dee Ramon. So, I, you know, I, I just have to ask you about that because yeah. that, because um and i think from when i talked to you from my book you you weren't really you know i mean i have cousins i haven't seen in like you know forever so it's not like oh someone's your cousin that means you're you're uh, clo you're close with them but you you guys didn't really see each other or you weren't really you saw him once in the 80s yeah yeah i went to uh i went to a ramon show and uh I knew one of the guys that was working the show and he went backstage and said, Hey, your cousin's here, you know, can he come back? And he's like, sure. You know, so I went backstage and hung out with him and, and, you know, got to meet him that time, but he was a big influence on me. Uh, just from the standpoint of, you know, he, he did it, you know, and, I don't know. It kind of just motivated me to say, Hey, I could do it too. You know? <laughs> so, so uh, I, I always looked up to him and um, started seeing him in magazines when I was in high school and rock scene well, magazine or, or cream. Or yeah. Whatever. Rocks rock scene was, yeah. The one I looked at in, in high school and yeah. So, yeah. And so I, I always followed them. I love the Ramones. Uh, you know, I even made my rock cast t-shirt kind of a tribute to Ramones, but uh, right. I, I think they were the coolest band ever. And uh, so. yeah. And people just forget like how revolutionary, you know, cause I was a little kid back then too. And people forget that that stuff was like, when you heard it at first, it was like you were hearing something from Mars because it, it was almost like a joke, you know? And uh, you know, no, no, no solos, no showboating, just rock and roll stripped to the bone with with purposely stupid lyrics, brilliant stupid lyrics, and you know that what was going on. Kiss was my gateway band, like in seventy, right, 70, right, and then maybe, and then that record came out, the first one, the first Ramones record came out that year. So like people forget just how. Uh, you know, the Ramones are beloved and deservedly so, but they just, people don't realize what was out there when they first came out. It was like, you light up my life, Debbie Boone and, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. I was, you know, it was, uh, I don't know. I always just look at it like, you know, they kind of help create a genre, you know, and how many people do that, you know, so. <sighs> I can't think of anybody. Not many people. So you only met him that one time, and you didn't try to stay in touch or anything. Nah, that was that was it. And uh, he seems like a hard person. He seems like a hard person to uh, carry on a long distance friendship with. Yeah. Um. You know. Busy. Yeah, I'm sure he was, and I don't know. Uh, when I met him, I don't know. I I think it was one of his sober periods where he wasn't you know doing anything drug wise or and and the whole vibe in the in the dressing room was just weird uh yeah, those guys all hated each other's guts for the yeah 
it was like, you know, Johnny, who I, if I could do it over, I would, you know, go over to Johnny and just kiss his feet or something. I, you know, <laughs> I, 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 Johnny I love, gets, I love Johnny Ramone now. He you gets, know, but, he, yeah, he gets a bum rap, but it's like, oh, Johnny, God. Johnny Ramone kept that whole thing going. Yeah, so great. But I, you know, I looked over and Johnny was just standing there, just totally silent, you know. And then some girl was like one inch away from Joey's face talking to him. And Joey was just like staring straight at, you know, like, what do I do? And then, you know, Dee Dee was standing there with me and he didn't really know what to say either. And it, the, the dressing room was just completely quiet. And right. it, was, it was just really kind of a awkward. weird, awkward vibe, you know? So we talked a little bit. I talked to Dee Dee a little bit about, you know, our cousins and stuff like that. And it, uh, it was, it was kind of right. weird. But at the it's same time, like, it was like, Oh God, I'll never forget that. That was so cool. So you were friends with Dee Dee's mom. Yeah. Yeah. I, I knew her a lot better than I did TD, but uh, yeah. So, but I, I always, I love telling people that, you know, I'm Dee Ramon's cousin, you know. I want to say thank you very much for giving me uh, an hour of your time, Lonnie. Yeah. And also if there's, um, if you want to promote anything or just say, hey, if you want to check out my stuff, go here this is your opportunity to do that all right um yeah my raw uh, my podcast is called monty's rock cast and uh, you can find that at monty's rockcast.com check out my podcast uh my art website is monty calvin and i've got all kinds of paintings for sale and so uh and i'm on facebook uh look me up on there uh, and if you want a painting or anything, commission me to do something, uh, drop me a message. I'm uh, very accessible. So.